folks, what we're going to study today is the book of Ephesians. Now, I want to give you a little bit of background history. Uh, I think it's important. This is one of the uh, four epistles that was known as the prison epistles. This is where the Apostle Paul was in prison in Rome. And I'm going to show you a picture of where he was at when he was actually writing this. So I want you to think for, 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 for a minute. We have bad days. We have bad situations in our life. But the Apostle Paul was a man that was called by God, used to go to the Gentiles. And that's one of the reasons why we're all here is through uh, Paul's ministry, the work of the Holy Spirit, and so forth. But God really used the Apostle Paul. But when you see where he was at and the circumstances he was in, our problems will seem very insignificant and very small when we actually compare our problems to what, what he went through. And yet the Lord used him, the Holy Spirit inspired him to write uh, in a prison in chains. So the book of Ephesians, a couple of things you should know. The whole theme of the book of Ephesians is the church. Okay, and we're going to learn as we go through the book of Ephesians, your identity in Christ, who you are in Christ. And this is, this is victorious, and it's very, very important. In chapter 1, as we get through there, and I don't know how far I'll get today, because i got a lot of good stuff that I, I believe that the Holy Spirit gave me to give to you. Chapter 1, it, the theme of chapter 1 is the church is the body of Christ. Every chapter represents something different. Okay, so we're going to see that. I think that's the reason why so many people have a difficult time studying the book of Ephesians and understanding it. All right. So if you look up here, you see a map. This is a map of Asia Minor. And Asia Minor is right here. And this is where the seven churches were that Jesus told the Apostle John to write letters to. Each church had significant problems or issues going on, as you read in the book of Revelation. But there's a dual purpose for these churches. I believe that these churches would also represent times of periods of history that churches would go through and would represent Christ. In the book of Ephesians, when Jesus told John to write to, the, to that particular church, it was a harsh letter because they were excited when they first started out in Christ and somewhere along the line, along their walk, along their race, they lost their first love. The excitement was gone. Uh, the zeal was gone. Everything became a ritual and a habit. So if you think about that, how many people today come to a church, claim to be Christians, but they just go through motions? There's no excitement. There's no fire burning. There's no zeal. It's just a place to go because they've done it in the past, and now the fire's gone. It's almost like as, as if you were looking at a candle. When you first get saved, that, that candle's burning, and then over a period of time, it starts to diminish and go out, and eventually the flame goes out, and you're just going through the motions. That's what the Ephesian church had gone through, okay? And this is something we all need to reflect how we're living, are we still excited? Are we still on fire for Christ? Do we get excited when the Lord opens up a door where we can be a witness for the Lord? And, and we should be. And if we're not, then we need to examine ourselves, fall on our knees, and call out to the Lord and say, Lord, I need a refresher. I need you to come back in. I need you to set me on fire. I need to be whatever. You know, I need to be set ablaze for the glory of Christ. Give me the joy. Give me the excitement back, right? Can I get an amen? amen. All right. This is why we want to constantly check our spiritual heartbeat. We've got to constantly be checking that. And uh, it's very, very important because if we don't, we could drift away and lose our first love. And that's where the Ephesians 
the uh, Fijians were eventually at that point. This is a picture of uh, the ancient city of uh, Ephesus. One of the things we're going to find that this was a pagan city. A lot of it was originally conquered by Alexander the Great. Then the Romans came in. The Romans built quite a few things there. They built the famous library, probably the most photographed ancient rooms probably in the world. You'll see a picture here in a minute. Uh, and you're going to see some pictures what archaeologists did of what it looks like today and what it would have looked like during the day, during the, this particular time. But this particular picture right here, that temple in the back, that's a pagan temple. I want you to take a close look at the structure because those Roman pagan temples that were used to represent and worship false gods also have influenced the whole world to a certain extent. And if you go certain places in our country, you'll see the same duplicates of this. I don't know if you're aware of that or not. Here is the Temple Haradian down on the bottom left. That's if you went to Ephesus today, that's what you would see. Archaeologists and uh, Bible scholars have worked on it. They put that together on top. They believe that's probably what it would have looked like back in Paul's day. The library that I was talking about, the top right, if you go to Ephesus today, which is in Turkey, that's what it currently looks like. Probably would have looked like the bottom right picture. And you notice the pedestals all have people standing, statues on there. These would have been famous governors or whatever, uh, political leaders and uh, so forth and so on. All right, this again is the same picture I showed you earlier. This is a pagan temple uh, where they had a statue inside where they worship the false god. Now, take a close look at that and then look at that. Does that look the same to you? <laughs> Pretty much, right? Okay, what do you think that, that is? I took that picture. Where? That one's not. Not in D.C.? Is that New York City? No. San Francisco? What is it? Is that San Francisco? No, that's Nashville, Tennessee. It is the... Uh, who said that? Yes. That is an exact duplicate of what's in, in Greece. The, 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 the Pythic, what did you say? Parthenon. Parthenon, thank you. And there's a, a, a false god inside that building. And I'm going to show it to you here in a minute. This is another building in America. What do you think that is? The Supreme Court. That is the Supreme Court. So what I'm telling you is a lot of the Roman, the Greco-Roman pagan temples we have built those type of structures in America. And I'm not trying to go off in a weird direction here. I'm just telling you that this has influenced uh, a lot of cultures for thousands of years. That particular statue is a false god. And you know where that's at? That is actually in the Hall of Congress. So if you go to Washington, D.C., and this was something that a few years ago, me and Melanie, we went up there on vacation, and we started to really look at all the symbols, all the statues, and it's amazing how much paganism has influenced all the structures up there. It's just, it really took us back when we seen it. That is the statue that's in the Nashville um, uh, 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 temple that was built. And you notice to the bottom right here, Everybody can see what that is? It's a serpent. So this was a false Greek god uh, that they worshipped. And uh, in Ephesus, you have all kinds of, during Paul's times, you had more of a Roman culture coming in. So they had a whole bunch of pagan temples throughout the whole city. And here's the thing. If you looked at closely at the pictures, you would have noticed they were elevated. So when you, when you read in the Old Testament, when God would tell one of the kings, one of the judges that was righteous, go and destroy all of the places of worship, okay? They were always in elevated places. That same pagan thing took place back in the day. And 
when Paul was there, one of the things that he dealt with more than anything was opposition to him preaching the gospel by the, the, the people that were incorporated in these pagan temples because it affected it. It pulled people away because they were getting saved, getting right with God. So they had less people donating money to the temple and it affected their livelihood. So Paul was a persecuted individual and there was quite a few at that time that Paul had actually visited there uh, in the past. There was a lot of different pagan temples there and one of them was Diana. This is the fertility god and uh, it was just, a, it's a very ugly statue to look at, but that was just one of the other uh, temples. Yes, brother. The Statue of Liberty is supposed to be part of the Antioch Falls God, too. Correct, correct. Yeah, yeah. Most, most people don't know that, but that, that, is, that is very, very true. All right, the picture I got up here, this is where the Apostle Paul was prisoned for probably a couple of years until he was beheaded. So he wrote, this is in Rome, you can actually go there. Uh, they know the exact place where Paul was kept. You notice the hole in the floor? That's where, he had, where he'd use the bathroom. Uh, so you can imagine the smell that was probably in there. So I want you to understand this. I want you just to, to think outside your comfort zone just for a minute and think about the Apostle Paul writing the letters under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. His eyesight was bad. He had to have somebody else actually write all of the epistles for him as he dictated them. But he would always write at the very end and he would sign and say this, Paul, I write with my own handwriting. I'm writing this part. Okay, because he always wanted to put his personal touch on these epistles and letters. And then these letters would be taken, copies would be made, and then they would be sent out to different churches. Okay, and the people at that time found great comfort and strength reading his letters. And it wasn't because Paul was writing them, it's because they were inspired by the Holy Spirit to meet the needs of the people at that time and certainly to meet the needs of us in th at this time. Does that make sense to everybody? So, Apostle Paul, his eyesight's bad. He's in a cold rock dungeon prison. He's got a toilet on the floor. No His eyesight lighting. is bad. No fluorescent lighting. No Cold fluorescent candles. lighting. No refrigerator to go to. Just whatever the gods would bring him. But yet still, he would rejoice and praise the Lord. So I just want you to think about that just for a moment. Because, and I, I don't mean this towards disrespect towards any of us because we're all in the same boat. But American Christians are so blessed. We have it so well. Sometimes we just forget and we just don't understand what some of our brothers and sisters had to face. All right, Ephesians chapter 1, if you'll open up your Bibles. And I promise you I'm not going to rush through Scripture because I'm going to go down some rabbit holes. And these rabbit holes are going to be really good stuff. All right. Bring it on. Bring it on. Here we go. Got your, got your safety belts on, your seat belts on. Verse 1, I'm reading from the New King James. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, listen to this, by the will of God to the saints who are in Ephesus and faithful in Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us, he's including himself. He's sitting in a dungy prison, sitting on rocks, with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ. Folks, could we say the same thing if we were in prison? Could we actually say the same thing? Or would we be having a pity party? And I think we all have pity parties, let's face it. I had one this past Friday when my work computer crashed and my flash drive that I put everything on crashed. I had a pity party for myself. Okay, so we all get to that point. But when you come out of the pity party and you realize and you look in the mirror, you need to shake it off and say, Lord, forgive me. Uh, my attitude wasn't good. I didn't respond well. I panicked. And I, I should always have my trust in you. 
no matter what comes. Somebody raised a hand. Yes. To, to get an idea, if you've ever been in a cave and you know how damp it right, is, right. And, and, and the lighting in the right. cave, it's not artificial lighting and so forth, that's where he was. Absolutely. He, wrote yep. he was in a damp, cold place, Absolutely. sitting on stone in a place like that, it's very cold. Right, well, good, good point. So during the Probably during the, the daytime, during the summer months, it was hot, sweaty, and at night it was cold. Probably didn't have all the, no the light in that. Room, yeah, you know, didn't have a heater in there. Light no air conditioning. So in a miserable place. So I want you to understand the in verse one where it says the will of God. I want you to understand this, okay? So what what if you go back and you look in the Greek, Rich, and you break it down. This is the, the, the wording that's used here is Thelma Tau Theus. And what it means is, uh, the will of God here, what it means in the Greek is, for the purpose of God to bless mankind through Christ. That is what this means. Okay, so Paul, by the will of God, is purposed and sanctioned to bless mankind through the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is a wonderful thing when you think about it. Now I want to read a couple other scriptures in the book of Acts, because this is important. It gives us a picture of, of Paul and his ministry and what God was going to do to him. In Acts chapter 22, 10, and I, I suggest you go back and read the whole chapter when you have time. This is after the apostle Paul meets the Lord. And he falls off the horse, he falls down as dead, and he sees this bright light and he realizes it's the Lord Jesus that's coming and making a personal visitation to the Apostle Paul. And everybody else heard a voice, but they didn't see anything. But Paul sees Jesus in his glory. And this is what happens. And I said, this is Paul speaking, what shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said unto me, Arise and go to Damascus, and there, there it shall be told thee of all the things which are appointed of you to do. So Jesus has an appointment for the Apostle Paul. But here's what, what Paul said, and this, this just kind of sticks with me. What shall I do? That should be the attitude we should all have. Lord, what should I be doing? What do I need to be doing? What is your will for my life? And we're going to get into that in a few minutes. It's wanting to know how we can better serve Christ. That's what it's all about. All right. Then in Acts 12, uh, uh, no, I'm sorry, 22, 12 through 15, then a certain Ananias, a devout man, according to the law, having a good testimony with all the Jews who dwelt there, came to me and he stood and said to me brother Saul receive your sight miracle a miracle took place and at that same hour I looked upon him and then he said the God of our fathers has chosen you that you should know his will and see the just one and hear the voice of his mouth for you will be his witness to all men of what you have seen and heard. A divine appointment, a divine appointment. But here's the thing, you have been chosen to, and, be, and, and to know his will. So my question to everybody in this room, do you know what God's will is for your life? Can you, no, nobody needs to raise their hand or anything. Do you actually know what God's will is for your for your life right now at this day this time this second so if you think about that okay I want to share with you seven things that will help you and I believe these are the seven ways that you could know that you're in the will of God okay number one seek and trust and walk with God number one seek trust and walk with God. Now I'm going to show you some scriptures that will back up every bit of this. Proverbs 3, 5 through 6. This is what the Bible tells us. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. So when I said trust, seek and trust, 
You've got to trust in the Lord that He is going to take your life. He's got a plan. He's got a purpose. Just like the Apostle Paul may not be as what we think is significant as the Apostle Paul, but it is. On the other hand, in God's eyes, your life is just as important as the Apostle Paul. Okay? So you have to think that way and do not let the enemy, do not let the devil whisper in your ear and say you're of no account. You don't know that much scripture so you never be that powerful. That's a lie from the devil. Your witness, your life, your resurrection from the dead, from, from the old man to the new man, the, new, the old woman to the new woman, you are a living reflection of Christ and you can be a, a godly influence in this darkening world. Amen? Does everybody understand that? That's awesome. Well, praise God for that. All right, let me read this scripture again. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. That particular part of that verse is in there for every single person in this room. Don't always lean on what you see, what you hear, what you think you know. But trust God. Put everything else aside. God's got your life. He's got everything under control. And when tough circumstances pop up, and they will, we're all going to face those things. We just got to trust God that He's got our life in control. It does not mean that your body is not going to have pain. It does not mean that we're not going to continue to age. And we may be sick at times. But we just got to trust the Lord. And in sickness and in pain, sometimes you, you learn the best lessons huh, that you'll ever learn in your life. It's through difficulty. If everything was a mountaintop experience, you would be praising the Lord and you'd be in the, what I call the whipped cream of Christianity. But you're never down the, in the battlefield. You're never actually engaged with other individuals. You're always too high and you're going to be really mostly ineffective to other people. Hopefully that makes sense. Verse 6. In all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. That's not Bob's words. This is the Holy Spirit telling us, acknowledge him. So when you wake up and you feel like uh, crud and you don't feel like getting out of bed, acknowledge the Lord. Praise the Lord that my eyes open today. Right? There's always something to be thankful. And when you do that, eventually I think you're going to feel, you know what, I don't quite feel the pain that I had earlier. You know what, thank you Lord. Praise your glorious name. I'm just going to magnify you today, regardless of your feelings. Go ahead. Right. Right. All right. That verse says, and he will direct your path. Amen. It's so important because when you praise him, you don't know. Even even if it's not somebody that you would perceive to be a Christian, right. could lead you to where you need to be. Absolutely. If you're praising the Lord, I sort of like not much in this path. Absolutely. Absolutely. Psalms 910. And those who know your name will put their trust in you, for you, Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. Now, this is an important ver verse. So if we seek the Lord, he's not going to forsake us. The answer may come not always the way we would expect it, but if we just constantly trust and walk in faith, God's going to work everything out. Sometimes we get impatient, right? We want something to happen right now. But God's timing is always perfect. And I've shared a few testimonies here about you, about me and my work where I was late for work. God put me to sleep and I woke up, drove like a maniac, got a speed ticket on the way. But God redirected a route that I had so I could speak for the Lord to an individual that was going to commit suicide that day. Right? I shared that with you guys my timing would have been different. But thank God that the Lord slowed me down so that I could be used as a vessel for Him. Not for my glory, but for His glory. Amen? Yes, yes ma'am. Um, talking about uh, not feeling like grace without praying. Right. I, I, there, there's a lot of times that I'm not feeling like praying. Right. And I'm like, Lord, I'm not feeling like praying. 
last week I had the same feeling, the same feeling like praying, I don't know what to say. Sure. And um, I put in my prayer closet, I sat down, and then I just, you know, I forced myself and just say, thank you, Lord, thank you, just start Right, yes. right. And do you know, that hesitation and not wanting to. You're right. Came one hour of there, there you go. That's awesome. Those, those are wonderful times. Yeah. And and. Just, yeah, it just was like, just like, wow, I wasn't feeling this way. I was feeling. Absolutely. So, I, and I can, I can share. Yesterday, when I went down in my basement, I get up real early. I went down in the basement, and my back was bothering me. Didn't feel like you. You know, I just didn't feel like praying. But I got down on my knees. I still get down on my knees. I, throw, I have to throw some pillows down, and and I, and I have to have that little cushion under these. But I got down. And I started to pray. Same thing happened. I just started to pray, and I just felt the presence of the Holy Spirit come, and then I felt an overwhelming where I just had to lift my hands up and just start to thank the Lord for his blessings. And, 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 and I thank him for this class, that I have this privilege and this honor to stand here in front of all of you. And, and I just started to weep and I just started to just bawl like a baby. And before I know it, you know, I'm not gonna use it, but the nose stuff that's in your nose was going everywhere. And my, I was flooding the floor. Thank God you had and, pillows. Yes, and I was an absolute mess. My eyes were swelled shut. And, and it was a glorious visitation of the Lord where I was just broken and I realized I'm very in, uh, insignificant in the big picture, but I'm so blessed and privileged to be able to be used by the Lord. And that's one of those times that you, you long for to be in the presence of God and you know he's moving. And uh, again, we, we got to just seek, we got to trust, and we got to walk yes. in a relationship with the Lord. Yes, Bob. So this just kind of came to my mind. So I, I try to pray for people specifically by name every day. And then, so I'm praying for people specifically by name so that maybe I give you a call and you've been sick. And then I kind of thought, well, but my prayers still work. And even though, because by doing those prayers, we may have been sicker than what, you know, so it doesn't mean just because we pray and we don't see the significance right then and there, we still have to do the prayer. Right. And we still have to, you know, push through it. Because, again, just like I said, we do not, it's not our understanding. It's God's Correct. understanding. That, that, that's so it. we need to be praying, even though I think, well, you're sick and my prayers aren't, no, they're doing something. And I, I'm sorry, I but that just... No, very good, very good. My, well, and that's very important because we always have the tendency to try to lean back on our understanding. Yeah. And that could be a trap for us yeah. because then it becomes not faith in what God can do, it becomes more of a trap where we're thinking we have something to do with it. Yes. And we really, really don't. Last scripture, and then I'm going to have to let you guys go. Colossians. And I love this. I love this. Colossians. If the, Colossians 3, 1 through 4. If then you were raised with Christ, this is the new birth, seek those things which are above. This is scripture telling us what we need to be putting our affections on, what we need to be setting our eyes on, where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind. You've got to have the right mindset on things above, not on things of this earth. For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear, appear with Him in glory. So Christians, here's what I'm telling you. And I've said this for a long period of time. Set your affections, your mind, on godly things. Don't be distracted by the things in this world. Folks, there's a lot of things coming that's going to happen. And there's going to be a lot of Christians that are going to be taken by surprise of the things that are coming. So you've got to, you've got to buckle down 
You got to get your feet planted in concrete, so to speak. The Apostle Paul uses the word steadfast. You got to be anchored in your relationship with Christ, and you got to be ready for what comes ahead because there's going to be unbelievers that are going to come to you and ask you questions. What do you think about all these things that are happening? What's going on? And we got to be anchored in Christ. Does that make sense to everybody? Amen. Brother Mike, will you close us out in prayer, please?